Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. This is the other thing with COVID, right, is that we get to narrate everything we're doing the entire time. It's, it's, it's apparently more fun that way. So welcome everyone uh, to our December public event for the RASC Montreal Centre. My name is Kareem Jaffer, I'm the public events coordinator. And today we are pleased to have with us to give today's talk one of our executive who is our space exploration guru, David Schumann. David has been leading our discussions on space exploration, on rocketry, on even space tourism uh, over the last couple of years. Ever since we moved on to the online platform, David has been open and ready to help us out with talks whenever we want and to offer talks during our clubhouses. Uh, our first event to get canceled when COVID happened was a talk that David was going to give for us on uh, places to go to tour if you're a space enthusiast. And so we're hoping once everything gets back to some semblance of normality to finally have that talk. But today we were going to have a talk on Apollo space rocks and our speaker unfortunately had to cancel and David stepped up right away and said that he would do a talk for us on the science missions. But before we get started with that talk, I am going to start us off as we start all of our public events, as well as our um, clubhouses, is with a spotlight on our honorary president, David Levy. David has been with us for many years, and I am very happy with the uh, the one real benefit from COVID has been that we've gotten to spend time with David every week. And that's been fantastic. We get to chat with him. We get to hear some of the wonderful stuff that he's been doing down in Arizona where they actually get clear skies on occasion. And he starts off all of our events with a literary reading for the day. So David, let me pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Kareem. And it's good to, good to be here. Good to see you. Looking forward to being here again on Wednesday when I believe I will be giving a lecture to the Wednesday group also on Zoom. You will. And um, anyway, because it is the Christmas season now, and it's Hanukkah, I'm going to do a quotation that I think is appropriate for the time. It's from the book of Isaiah. And it says, and I'm going to make a couple little changes in it. For example, he, the first word I'm going to say, she or he that sitteth above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Thou stretchest out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. That is so appropriate whenever I'm out in my observatory, I feel that it is a tent from which I can see the curtain of the night sky. Thank you, Kareem, and back to you. Looking forward to this talk. Thank you so much, David. That was Beautiful. And yes, I mean, when you're out at your Jarnak Observatory, it's fantastic to, to be there under the curtain of the night sky. Uh, we tend to start off all of our talks with a land and sky acknowledgement, where we talk a little bit about the fact that we share the night sky with the traditional indigenous peoples of our world, and specifically for us here in the Montreal area with the Mohawk and Algonquin peoples. Most of the time our public events are held near a full moon. And so I talk about the Mi'kmaq moon name and I talk about the moon from other cultures, yes. but at the moment we're actually close to a new moon. And so as a result, I wanted to talk a little bit about the winter maker when Orion, what we refer to as Orion, or some of us refer to it as the Slender Man, depending on what culture you grew up in. When Orion is up at sunset, you know that winter has come. And when winter has come, it's a time to not travel too far from your homes in the indigenous times. It's also a time to reflect and to share stories and to spend some time together with our family, with our friends, and reminisce a little bit and share the knowledge that we have. And we tend to do that during our clubhouses. And as David mentioned, our next clubhouse this Wednesday, he's taking some time to chat with us about his early days with the Montreal Center. Now, those of you who've read his autobiography or come to some of our events where we've had chats about the early days, know that he went through a tumultuous time. Uh, trials and tribulations, tumultuous time. I mean, this is the alliterative way to talk about his early days in the Montreal Center. 
And this Wednesday, he's going to talk a little bit about that and reflect on how that led to the friendships that he has now and this, the honorary president role that he now serves within our, our club. As well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Rask Montreal Center because I know some of you are members and some of you are affiliates and friends of ours. And so if you do ever come to Montreal or if you're in Montreal and you want to become a member, we have been a club for over 100 years. We have more than 170 members. And even through COVID, we have continued with our bi-weekly events. We do have an observatory at the Morgan Arboretum uh, just here in the West Island of Montreal with a 14 inch telescope. And we also have a dark sky site down near the US border. We do all sorts of events. We have a library at John Abbott College. We have uh, outreach talks that we give to local groups and libraries. And we have our own newsletter, Skyward, which we publish every couple of months. We also take part in the RASC observing programs, and we have specialized events to talk about how to search for some of these. And we've been doing a little bit of the Explore the Moon and Explore the Universe and even the Messier Object Challenges within our club. If you do want to become a member, uh, the annual membership is uh, one of the best values in the entire universe. It's uh, $97 for an adult. It's uh, $55.25 for a youth. And for family members, the first member pays just a little bit less than a regular member, but then every additional member is a very, very highly reduced price. And even going into 2022, we're going to continue with a lot of Zoom events, but we're also hoping to resume a lot of in-person events as the situation permits. Our upcoming events, we actually have two outreach events this month, uh, this a week from yesterday on Friday, December 10th, we're taking part in the IREX Astro Mill Festival at the Institute for Research for Exoplanets at University of Montreal. We're going to be setting up an outreach table and if weather permits, we're hoping to share some views of the night sky. Uh, and several of our members have volunteered to be part of this event. During the event in a panel discussion, we are joined with several scientists from University of Montreal and McGill and the CSA, as well as astronaut David Saint-Jacques is going to be there. So if you're interested, you can drop us a line and we'll help you understand how to get connected. But if you go and visit the IREX website, there is a sign up point right there. On December 14th, we have a Geminid meteor shower viewing for the city of Bader Fay. And that one is of course subject to COVID protocol. And we're also planning our public events for 2022. And we are gonna start off in January 22nd with the 30th anniversary of Dr. Roberta Bondar's mission aboard Discovery, where she became the first neurologist and the first Canadian woman in space. We're hoping to actually co-host this event with our friends at the University of Guelph, which is her alma mater. We're also hoping on February 18th to do a celebration of Perseverance's one year on Mars and learn a little bit about the things that Perseverance has discovered and that Ingenuity has discovered, the wonderful little helicopter that has been touring Mars alongside Perseverance. So join us for our public events in 2022. Keep an eye out on Facebook, on our website, as well as on our email list. And you can always message us or visit our website if you have questions. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that early this morning in Antarctica, there was a total solar eclipse. It has been uh, actually recorded on the NASA website. They had a live view of it at 2.30 uh, in the morning. So I was up watching, of course. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful view. And this wonderful time lapse was put together by some of the Russian researchers down in Ellsworth Mountains in Antarctica, and they published it in the Marca newspaper in Chile. The reason why I bring this up is because we are also starting already some work on planning for the total solar eclipse on April 8th, 2024, which will have totality visible in Montreal if weather permits, as well as many other parts of the province. So a lot of the local institutions and groups have been working hard to try to get the local government to recognize this as something that we should work towards and put into the curriculum so that everybody knows what an eclipse is and what it is that we're going to be seeing. And with the RASC nationally, we're planning with the Astronomical League in the States a trip out to Texas for those who want a little bit more surety of having a good chance to see totality because clouds in Montreal in April are an unfortunate fact of life. And so we are going to be hanging by the seat of our pants, hoping to see this total solar eclipse. Now for tonight, our main event, we are joined by our local research and development executive, David Schumann. And David has been working for the last few years on sharing with us a lot of his knowledge on the history of some of the missions 
from NASA as well as from other countries. And way back two years ago when we did the Apollo 11 50th anniversary, David gave a wonderful presentation at the Cosmodome on the Apollo 11 50th and even uh, hosted a movie showing both at the Cosmodome as well as at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto uh, for the benefit of people who are aficionados of space exploration. So today he's going to share with us a little bit of the background of science missions that the Apollo undertook after the Apollo 13 accident that managed to thankfully not actually uh, cause any fatalities. And when they got back to their science missions, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, they did some wonderful work. So he's gonna share with us a little bit of that history. So David, take it away. Thank you, Karim, and uh, thanks David for a fantastic uh, uh, reading uh, this afternoon. Um, okay, so I'll share my screen. Uh, make sure I share the right one. Does everybody see the full screen? We do, thank you. Okay, I'll start off. So um, I'm gonna start off by uh, saying that, um, just one second. I, I believe that the Apollo missions was one of the most fantastic human undertakings ever. When you think about it, humankind left for another world for the first time. And we're all very familiar with Apollo 11 and the planting of the flag on the moon and all the ceremonies and, and excitement that that brought. And then of course, the drama of Apollo 13, uh, the lightning striking uh, Saturn V for Apollo 12's launch and uh, you know, uh, Apollo 14. But as time went on, uh, the public did start to uh, wane in interest and there were, uh, you know, political um, um, circumstances and the, uh, the wars going on like in Vietnam conflict. And so the Apollo missions were becoming a finite uh, commodity. There were supposed to be 18, 19, and 20, and the uh, remnants of those missions have been scattered in museums around the um, United States and are, are available for viewing today. But it's too bad because those missions should have actually been, you know, left behind on the moon and everything. Uh, so the, the missions, the J missions, um, focusing more on scientific endeavors, uh, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, at that point, they already knew that this would pretty well be the end of the Apollo program as the budget uh, was cut and um, NASA was moving on to other um, activities for the later 70s, like Skylab, for example, and low Earth orbit research. So they had to make the most of what they could for Apollo 15, 16, and 17. And what better way to do that than to get to be able to have an excursion around the lunar module without being only on foot, because there's just such a limitation. It's hard enough as it is to be in a, in a bulky spacesuit. Um, it's very easy to trip or topple over. Um, and if you had a way to get around, you could go kilometers or miles around the actual landing site and explore things that you never could in the 11, 12, and 14 uh, missions. So enter the lunar rover, which uh, we'll talk about in a minute, which was one of the major additions to these uh, Apollo J missions. And that meant that the um, uh, lunar module had to be optimized, not only to stow away um, this lunar rover, um, but there were even more scientific uh, packages and experiments um, and uh, more rocks uh, collected than ever before. Uh, so um, as time went on, they had more improvements um, and they were able to uh, find ways to bring more material with them to the moon. Um, and the lunar rover being one of these amazing things. So today when we talk about the Apollo missions and we always see these famous um, images of the lunar rovers with the dust being kicked up with those treads, uh, uh, the, uh, the actual wheels of the lunar rover. Um, those are really the Apollo 15, 16, 17 J missions. They're not the earlier missions. Um, so this is one of the significant uh, components of the later and final Apollo missions. So I'm gonna start off by talking about Apollo 15. Um, 
So the crew of uh, Dave Scott, the commander, James Irwin, the lunar module pilot, and uh, Alfred Warden, the command module pilot. Remember that there were two lucky uh, um, astronauts that would actually get to go down to the surface of the moon, and one had to be left behind in the um, in the uh, command module circling the moon because you know they had to make sure that there was something to come back to and, um, and take care of uh, logistics. So it was always known that two astronauts would be landing on the moon and going for an excursions or uh, extra vehicle uh, activities, EVAs, and one person would always be left behind. Um, and in this case, it's um, Erwin and Scott that uh, got the uh, chance to go to the surface of the moon. And um, the payload was the Endeavour and the Falcon was the actual uh, lander. So uh, the command module named Endeavour. And it's, it's interesting the way our modern ships today, like the Space Shuttle Endeavour, you know, they do have a legacy to these, um, to the Apollo missions like Columbia as well. Um, well, on July 26th, uh, the launch happened at Cape Canaveral and um, pad 39A, that's the classic pad used today by SpaceX for these Falcon uh, launches actually. So it's still being used to today, a very historical uh, launch site. And um, after orbiting and, uh, you know, they had to take the lunar module out of the, um, uh, the upper stage of the Saturn V and then uh, connect to it. And uh, this would take them on, on the way towards the moon. Um, uh, things went well and um, I'll continue. So just to briefly say that Apollo 15 was the first of the Apollo J missions. This was capable of a longer stay on the moon, up to three days on the surface of the moon. So this way they can actually take time and have multiple EVA events and have contingencies in case there was a, um, a, a mishap or anything, they, they would have more time and more chances to make up for that. And because it was so precious, it did cost billions of dollars. And I always remind people that it did cost the lives of three really good astronauts that lost their lives in the Apollo 1 uh, launch pad fire um, um, uh, about a decade earlier, which almost ended the whole program. So I always remind people that when we went to the moon, there were many sacrifices, not by only by hundreds of thousands of engineers and scientists from, from the United States and around the world here in Canada as well. But people actually gave their lives for this project, for Project Apollo. And um, it was so precious that when we went to the moon, that the most be maximized out of what we could do when we got there. So one of the questions is like, where did the moon come from? Um, what can it teach us about, about us, about the earth? Um, what, you know, um, what could it tell us about the solar system? Was the moon the same as the earth? Was it captured? Did it come from somewhere else? Well, these final missions of the Apollo uh, um, 15, 16, 17 would try to help uh, even more in the answering of those questions, which we still are learning new things even to today. So there were four primary objectives falling in the general categories of lunar surface science. And this text, by the way, is directly from NASA. Um, like, uh, so just to say, um, they would set up our orbital science and engineering op uh, operational. The mission objectives were to explore the Hadley uh, Apennine region, set up and activate lunar scientific experiments, and make engineering evaluations of new Apollo equipment, and uh, conduct lunar orbiting experiments and photographic tasks. Keep in mind, this is at an era when digital media was just burgeoning. So to get those color images from the surface of the moon live, quote unquote, was a big deal. And back then, they were lucky to get with the transmission of, of uh, images back to the Earth, uh, what we would call today CGA resolution or 320 by 240, roughly that like VHS quality resolution. But it was still a major thing to have a live image of what was going on. But the best way, and even to today, to mine that image data, the best way was to use a Hasselblad 70 millimeter uh, film camera. And when that scanned, even with today's modern digital technology, we're talking about 8 to 16K of data per frame of film. That's still a tremendous amount of high quality uh, color and black and white imagery. 
um, they would use transparency film for the ultimate uh, in quality and 16 millimeter portable motion picture cameras um, that were not only attached around the lunar module and capsules, but they were able to use these on the lunar rover itself and with the video images too. Um, so not only did these missions help with the science, but they were all also proving new technologies that were uh, like the lunar rover, but newer camera lenses. Keep in mind how frigid it is on the moon. On one hand, you got the sunlight baking everybody and, and equipment in, in a lot of heat. And then on the flip side of that, in the dark areas, you've got hundreds of degrees below zero Fahrenheit or Celsius. At that point, it doesn't matter. It is so cold. So new technologies were developed to deal with this. Um, so changes to the Apollo spacesuit and portable life support system uh, were evaluated and the performance of the lunar rover vehicle and other new J mission equipment that went with it, the communications by relay units and the ground controlled television assembly uh, were also tested uh, for the first time. Another mission objective involved the launching of a particle and fields or PNF subsatellite. I'll show you a picture a little later. Um, it's kind of a little baby satellite uh, into lunar orbit by the command and service module um, or CSM shortly before beginning the return to Earth portion of the mission. The subsatellite was designed to investigate the moon's mass and gravitational variations, particle composition in the space near the moon and interaction of the moon's magnetic field with that of Earth. So look at this beautiful launch. Uh, I mean, I, I would have given ever, anything to be at that launch. Think about the, um, you know, close to 7 million pounds uh, of thrust generated by these uh, Saturn V uh, F, F1 engines. And uh, their destination for Apollo 15 would have been the Hadley Ryle about 1500 feet northeast of the target landing point. That's where they went uh, near a crater called, uh, named as uh, Salyut. Landing approach over the Apennine region where the highest on the moon was at an angle of 26 degrees, the steepest approach yet used in Apollo missions. So also keep in mind that unlike the Artemis missions that are upcoming, um, hopefully sooner than later, uh, there's been some delays. Um, we'll be going to the Shackleton crater region in the south pole of the moon, looking for water hidden in the shadows of, of, of you know, the moon where water is still able to be frozen. We only went close to the equatorial regions of the moon. And a lot of this also was because, simply because of, of line of sight communications as well. We did not have the TDRA system or tracking and relay satellites around, um, well, around the earth and an area that could relay uh, communications back to earth. So it was very crucial that there was more of a line of sight directly to earth for uh, images. So here's a gorgeous 3D developed by the Arizona State University. They have fantastic resources. I urge you to check their website, uh, ASU. And what they did was they used the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, data to recreate 3D maps of the moon. And here we see on the right, the actual um, EVA that they took with the um, lunar rovers uh, for kilometers on the surface of the moon both on Hadley Ryle and closer to uh, Mount Hadley itself. And um, this way you could see the Silver Spur, St. George, Bright Peak Hill 305 and Hadley Sea uh, Crater. Um, but you get more of a bird's eye view or a sense of sensation um, of where they went exploring on Apollo 15. It's quite picturesque. So during the three periods of extravehicular activity on July 31st and August 1st and 2nd, uh, Scott and Irwin completed a record of 18 hours and 37 minutes of exploration. Uh, they traveled 17 and a half miles in the first car that humans have ever driven on the moon, collected more than 170 pounds, almost as heavy as me, but not quite, um, of lunar samples, set up the LSEP array, see NASA loves these acronyms, and obtained a coarse sample from about 10 feet beneath the lunar surface, provided extensive uh, oral descriptions and photographic documentation of geologic features in the vicinity of the landing site during the three-day, 66-hour stay on the surface. So here you see the Silver Spur, one of the first uh, items encountered on those uh, outings. And um, 
I don't know about you guys, you just look at this and it's just, you know, it's the classic moonscape uh, pockmarked with craters and, and these hills formed by uh, geologic activity over, you know, millions of years. Um, but by taking samples in different areas, uh, you know, scientists back on Earth were able to figure out why these things uh, developed. Are these craters volcanic in nature? Were they from, uh, you know, meteorite impacts? Um, and we'll talk about that uh, a little later. The Hadley Apennine, um, you know, and with your telescopes here on Earth, no, you're not going to see the flag on the moon, so don't ask about that. But you can see the major crater features that were near these uh, Apollo landing sites. And uh, there's great maps online that show you where to look. So when you're looking through your telescope in high power when you can, think about the fact that human beings visited the places you're looking at and left things behind as well. That LCEP package uh, was a standardized package that was left on the moon uh, on Apollo 15, 16, and 17, even the earlier missions. But these were a suite of kits like seismometers, um, color chart, uh, when they would take photographs, they would have um, known color reference charts. I'll show you a picture um, a little later, and there's a good reason for that. Um, and many, many other instruments. Was there an atmosphere on the moon? I, I know the moon's a, mostly a vacuum, but not completely. So, um, you know, it's interesting. So on August 2nd, the Lunar uh, uh, Falcon fired its ascent stage and the engine lifted off the moon for its first rendezvous with the command module. So think about it. Not only did they go down to the moon for a few days and stay in a very compact uh, um, area, um, you know, think about going inside of a, a camper, except only in one part of that camper. It's pretty tight, but they had to stay in there for three days. And that's what protected the two astronauts from the harsh radi radiation, um, you know, uh, punishing the surface of the moon. But the the descent stage would be left behind and, and an, ex, um, an ascent stage chemically driven um, would would uh, allow the ascent stage to, to rendezvous again with the command module so that they could return home. Everything had to work perfect. Um, as you can see here on the right, when they splashed down, one of the main chutes failed. So it actually only made them fall about two miles an hour faster, hitting the ocean surface around 20, 21, uh, I believe, miles per hour instead of 19. Uh, so that was like more um, as a backup, but nothing, not everything went perfect, but it mostly did. So Alfred Warren became the first human to carry out a deep space EVA. What does that mean? We see a lot of EVAs, extra vehicle activities or spacewalks, but they're nine, uh, up until then they were all carried out near the Earth's orbit. And this time, how do you think we got all these fantastic images? Images from the point of view of, of um, outside the spacecraft. Well, these are remote cameras, movie cameras and film cameras. Um, and unlike television cameras where the uh, image beams could be recorded back on Earth or inside of the, uh, the uh, spacecraft, these film cartridges were undeveloped and they had to be physically uh, well, captured by an astronaut in the EVA, then they go back in the capsule, bring them to Earth, and then develop these precious pieces of uh, film. So uh, this was done by the first uh, EVA. He exited the command module, climbed aboard the rear of the service module, and retrieved film cassettes from the Simbe uh, cameras and returned the, the command module. The entire operation was completed 18 minutes, uh, but they allotted an hour. Um, Apollo 15 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean and uh, not far from Honolulu, but 300 miles, ending the flight of 12 days and seven hours. So Apollo, uh, I'm sorry, Apollo 15 set several new records for crewed space flight, the heaviest payload in lunar orbit, 107,000 pounds, that's uh, pretty heavy. Uh, maximum radio distance traveled to the lunar surface away from the spacecraft, 17.5 miles. See, this was, you know, the lunar rover allowed for this. Um, and the most lunar service EVAs, three at the time, and the longest total duration on the surface, 18 hours, 37 minutes, and the longest time in lunar orbit. So they were pushing the boundaries of what they could do from before. And uh, this was the longest crewed mission of 295 hours. They also, like I mentioned earlier, 
uh, were able to orbit a satellite placed in lunar, or in lunar orbit by a crewed spacecraft. And I believe that this mission for that satellite was supposed to last one year. Moving on to Apollo 16, and uh, this is one of my favorites, actually. So um, in the middle of this part of the presentation, I'll show you a lot of pre-mission um, uh, images. Um, so the crew, John Young, Charles Duke, and Thomas Mattingly, um, uh, they, uh, payload was the Casper and the Orion uh, lunar uh, module. Um, and launched on April 16th, 1972. So they would launch from I mean, two, three times a year, these missions. Um, space shuttle missions later on would be about an average of eight times a year. And, and for the future, the Artemis missions at the beginning are slated to launch once a year or once every two years uh, before they become more operational. Um, so we'll move on. As I mentioned earlier, it's the first time because of 16, 17, uh, 15, 16, 17 were more uh, focused on scientific research. All the astronauts were actually at a master's degree level of geologic um, education. So they, they, they received a lot of education from professors, from, uh, from uh, geolo geologists on, here on earth with practical experiences of what to look for on the moon to maximize the amount of time for collecting the right kind of samples that we can study even up till today and in the future here. So here on the left, Apollo 16 astronaut Charles Duke and John Young examine a rock outcrop during the, mis no, I'm sorry, the November 1971 geology field trip in the Costco Hills in California. So there's places here on Earth, like in Arizona, California, even in the Arctic, um, that can be doppelgangers, let's say, for the dry conditions you'd find on the moon or the right basalt conditions of volcanic uh, rocks, for example. On the right, Duke left and Young in the uh, Grover, a ground-based trainer for the lunar uh, roving vehicle in the Cosgo Hills. So here, Charles and Duke left and Young practice getting in and out of the lunar roving vehicle. Um, think about it, you're inside this, this kind of spacesuit that's not too flexible, kind of like the Michelin, uh, the Michelin Man. Uh, you're all like stuffed up and like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man from, from uh, Ghostbusters. You can't move around too easily. Newer spacesuits that are being worked on now for Artemis are supposed to have much more articulation and freedom. But, you know, this is what they had in the 1970s with life support. And, and you know, this is a pressure vehicle for people. And so they had to learn how to, well, how do you get the lunar rover out of the quote unquote garage you know, it's all fold, folded and stowed away, physically get into it and then get out of it. Um, it's essentially like a golf cart with an open air. Uh, there's no canopy though. And, you know, it is battery powered. Um, so using mock-ups, they practiced the, um, at Kennedy Space Center uh, in Florida. And the engineers perform a fit check with the right versions of the lunar rover vehicle and the lunar modules backups uh, astronauts uh, look on. So here, um, they trained for a lunar surface spacewalk, including deploying the American flag at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Um, left a, um, Duke and Young uh, practiced the lunar roving vehicle in Kennedy Space Center simulated lunar surface. Keep in mind all the dust too, it, even from early on, it was always thought that the, they didn't know before Apollo 11 how deep the lunar dust was. There were fears that the uh, landing module, uh, lunar module will actually sink down into, into a sea of dust. This turned out not to be the case. It was just um, a couple of inches to about a foot deep in, in uh, lunar dust. Still a major problem for spacesuits getting into the joints, uh, clogging up, um, you know, the lunar uh, uh, rover as well. Here's a part of those instrument packages. Uh, so the technicians observe uh, astronauts practicing deploying the instruments of the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package. In the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building, at the KSC Center in Florida, astronauts Charles Duke, far left and young, on the right, listen as principal investigator George Carruthers Center describes the far ultraviolet camera and spectrograph they will deploy as the first observatory on the lunar surface. So this would be the first time we'd look back away from Earth using this kind of instrument in these frequencies um, in ultra, uh, ultraviolet without um, influence of the Earth as much. 
uh, Charles Duke, left and young, and Stuart Usa, Edgar Mitchell, partially obscured. Um, we got a briefing from NASA geologists, right, in the Lunar uh, Receiving Laboratory at the Manned Space Conference Center, now Johnson Space Center in Houston, uh, left bed. Um, Duke left and Young examined moon rocks returned from the Apollo 15 crew. And this is a completely hermetically sealed um, environment not to spoil the moon rock samples. So I'll just go through this briefly because um, there is a lot uh, going on here. Uh, three primary objectives are to inspect, survey, and sample the materials on surface features at a selected landing site in the Descartes region. In, uh, in place, activate surface experiments and conduct in-flight experiments and photographic tasks from lunar orbit. Additional objectives perform this experiment requiring zero gravity and engineering evaluation of spacecraft and equipment. The decarding landing site in the highlands region of the moon, southeast quadrant characterized by a hilly grooved furrowed terrain. It was selected as an out, out, outstanding location for sampling two volcanic construction units of the highlands. Wow. Uh, they, uh, Cayley Formation and the Kant Plateau. The Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments, or uh, ALSEP, which was a standard package, by the way, like I mentioned earlier, for, for all these missions, was the fourth such station to become operational after Apollo 12, 14, and 15. Um, they used, uh, like I mentioned earlier, 16 millimeter motion picture cameras and Hasselblad 70 millimeter high resolution cameras. And, and minor changes in surface extraditivity equipment were evaluated, a stronger clutch spring and television camera to help in better transmission um, and even uh, longer seat belts uh, to make things a little uh, easier um, and help with the drilling so that they can do like better core sampling. Um, a significant addition to the surface objectives with an ultraviolet stellar camera to return photography of the earth and celestial regions in spectral bands not seen from earth. Uh, the Grand Prix exercise consisting, and we've seen many of these famous videos, like S-turns, hairpin turns, and hard stops was also to be conducted to test the, uh, you know, the maximum envelope of capabilities of the lunar rover. Final or uh, orbital objective is launch a sub-satellite uh, shortly before uh, uh, trans-Earth injection. This was that second type of, uh, of that same satellite, but this time uh, it had an issue where it only lasted a few months. Um, the objective of the particles and fields subsatellite was to investigate the moon's mass and gravitational variations, particle composition in space near the moon and the interaction of the magnetic field with that of Earth. So the lunar module carrying John Young and Charles Duke touched down at Descartes, but um, 276 meters northwest of the planned point, um, about 9.24 PM Eastern time. During the 71 hour, two minute surface stay, astronauts explored the region on three EDAs, totaling 20 hours, 14 minutes. The first was included lunar roving vehicle setup and LSEP deployment. Heat flow experiment was lost when Young tripped on an electronic cable breaking it. Rover Traverse took astronauts wed to Flag Crater and uh, where they collected samples and photographed the area. You can see some of the pictures uh, here on the left. Return drive was south of the outbound uh, track to Spook Crater um, viewed on the bottom, where astronauts took the first measurements with the lunar portable magnetometer, gathered samples, and took both panoramic and 500 millimeter telephotography just before return to the lunar mod uh, uh, module. So here you could see part of that on the right, the ALSEP uh, package uh, that was left behind, including the seismometer to um, uh, investigate, you know, moon quakes and, and if there's any seismic activity on the moon and what could potentially be causing that. Because up until this time, we still weren't sure too much of what the composition of the moon was and how active or dead it was in comparison, let's say, to the Earth's uh, ongoing uh, seismic activity. Of course, the Earth has a lot of tectonic activity and plates. The moon seems to be a little more on the uh, lifeless side in that regards. So Apollo 16 lifted off at uh, 1254 Eastern time from uh, Kennedy Space Center on the Saturn V. And they, they came down, um, they touched down um, a couple of days later and they explored the region on three EVAs. Um, and here's the spook crater that I showed you earlier, but a super wide panorama you can see on the bottom. So the real-time flight planners deleted four stops because they did have an issue. Um, so that uh, robbed them a little planned time. 
uh, and from the third and final EVA because of time constraint and the meeting is sent schedule. Um, because they, uh, the second EVA began, uh, began with the drive to the South Stone, um, Stone Mountain where the surface and core samples uh, were collected at two stations in the area of uh, central craters along with the trench sample and penetrometer and measurements and photography. Um, one station was deleted as I mentioned because of uh, time factors um, and the lunar portable magnometer or LPM measurement were taken near Senko. The astronauts drove north uh, to North Ray Crater or House Rock, where you can see an inset picture of House Rock and a close up here on the bottom. Inside the crater room was sampled. Returning south, the crew stopped at Shadow Rock for additional sampling, photography, and LPM measurements. Final stop near the lunar module added samples and core tubes to the collection. And these core samples are important because, uh, you know, it's nice to take like just surface samples, but uh, just below the core of things, as we all know here on Earth, when you dig a little further down or on Mars, you get a very different story possibly of what's underneath the, the regolith or the powder, the, the dust that covers most of the moon's surface. So these core samples would be crucial uh, for science in the future. So um, uh, Thomas Manoli was orbiting uh, the moon with cameras and, and Simbay instruments. Um, operating during the surface day of Young and Duke. The results were verified. Apollo 15 data and provided information lunar train not previously covered. So here you could see the lunar liftoff, and this is from those TV cameras that were left behind on the surface. And I, I know a lot of people say, well, yeah, you know, this, uh, you know, it's, it's this whole thing. But yeah, that's how they got the images. They left back uh, robotic cameras um, that were able to film the actual takeoff and those cameras were left behind on the moon with the video transmission sent to earth. That's why they're so fuzzy. Um, and yet the images on the, on the middle and the right are in very high resolution because they used film cameras, which in the 1970s had far more resolution than digital uh, imagery did at the time. Um, Mattingly took an 83 minute spacewalk to retrieve these film cassettes. Normal entry and landing result in splashdown um, just before 3 p.m. Eastern time on April 27th. So the total mission time was 265 hours, 51 minutes. Now we do collected 209 pounds of sample and drove the rover at 16.6 miles. Here's a beautiful illustration of that deployment of that uh, satellite, the Apollo Particles and Field Subsatellite. So the goal of this satellite, so it's not only surface exploration, but exploration around the moon itself. And the main objective of the small satellite uh, were to study the plasma particle magnetic field uh, environment of the moon and map the lunar gravity field. This would help in future missions that we're planning with Artemis, for example, so that we could build better shelter and protection for longer term stays on the surface of the moon. Uh, the accomplishments of the satellite orbited the moon for 34 days. This was because during which it provided data similar to the Apollo 15 satellite, its short lifetime instead of the planned one year resulted from a low orbit which the Apollo 16 astronaut astronauts were forced to place because of problems within the main engine of their command and service module. So things weren't always perfect as we might imagine, you know, um, there's a problem with the engine and so they had to make certain sacrifices, but all in all, Everybody landed, uh, say, like splashed down safely, and tremendous strides um, in exploration were made. Uh, on the spacecraft itself, the, the little spacecraft was a magnetometer, an S band transponder, and charged particle detectors. So, here I just want to show on the left, like, you know, um, kind of a bird's eye view of the Apollo 16 landing site. And on the right, you can see those um, extra, um, the extra vehicle. Um, uh, exploration using the lunar rover um, on the different areas that they were able to travel around 16 kilometers. So this gives you um, a, a nice path of where they went uh, to that Cinco crater area and uh, near the Smoky Mountain region. Here you can see um, the retrieval of those film cartridges and without those we wouldn't have many of these uh, uh, these uh, images taken of the spacecraft themselves. So this is one of the few ways that things could be documented for everybody to see. The splashdown uh, near Hawaii and of course the aircraft carrier. I'm not quite sure what the story is with that uh, Tiger, um, but I'm sure um, I can look into that. But uh, the uh, amazing ceremony after the quarantine, of course. 
Moving on to the final Apollo mission. And you know, at the time they knew this would be the last time Gene Sarman knew getting back onto the ascent um, at the lunar module for ascent that he would be the last person to set, um, you know, they would be the last two people to set foot, uh, foot on the moon. But I don't think that they ever realized we still haven't gone back yet. And it's 2022 in a few weeks from now. And although we we're promising and planning to go back and this time to stay apparently, um, in my honest opinion, it's still been far too long. As a kid growing up with these Apollo missions and watching shows like The Six Million Dollar Man and The Astronauts, I really thought growing up in the 80s, we'd be definitely going back to the moon and having you know, actual um, space, uh, you know, space stations on the moon itself, but no, we're still not there yet. So these missions uh, up to today, they're quite precious. So Eugene Cern, commander, Harrison Schmidt, and Ronald Evans, the command module pilot. Now, the special case with this is Harrison Smith was actually a geologist. So the first time an actual uh, trained scientist actually went to the surface of the moon. Um, up, up until that, everybody else uh, had a military background, but he had an actual science background. Uh, so he knew um, better than uh, the other astronauts, even with their training, uh, even more of what to look for and what to collect on the surface of the moon. So the objective of this final mission was the lunar landing site was the Taurus Litro Highlands and the Valley area. This site was picked for Apollo 17 as a location where the rocks both older and younger than those previously returned from the Apollo missions, as well as from Luna 16 and 20 missions might be found. The mission was the final in a series of three JTEC missions planned for Apollo program. These JTEC missions can be distinguished from the previous G and H series by extended hardware capability along with scientific larger scientific payload capacity and the use of the battery powered lunar uh, ro rover uh, uh, vehicle. Yeah, so today we have electric vehicles like the Tesla, but this was the first, one of the first of these electric vehicles. Um, science scientific objectives of Paul 17 included geological surveying and sampling materials, surface features in a pre-selected area of the Taurus littoral region, deploying and acti activating surface experiments and conducting in-flight experiments and photographic tests. These objectives included uh, deployed experiments as Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments or LSEP package, which I mentioned were also deployed in the earlier Apollo uh, missions. So at least there's a consistent um, set of uh, uh, experiments left behind on the moon. Um, with the heat flow experiment, lunar seismic profiling and lunar uh, gravimeter and atmospheric composition experiment or LACE. Um, and Luna, a lunar ejecta meteorites or LEAN. The mission also included lunar sampling and lunar orbital experiments. There were also um, human experiments, like biomedical experiments included in the biostack and the biocore experiments. So the one cool thing about Apollo 17, it was the one and only Saturn V night launches, which created a spectacular uh, view over the Florida coast, lighting up uh, the whole state of Florida and then some. Um, and approximately 15 uh, minutes after the launch on December 7th, the uh, CSM docked with the lunar module. Um, only one of the four planned mid-course corrections were required, so it's pretty accurate. Lunar orbit insertion was accomplished, and then they're placing the spacecraft in the lunar, lunar orbit um, of 170 by 52 nautical miles. So at 6.55 p.m. on December 11th, the lunar module placed onto orbit with a perilunar attitude of 6.2 nautical miles. 47 minutes later, the power descent to the lunar surface began. Apollo 17 was the last lunar man landing mission. Three EVA activities uh, lasted a total of 22 hours. So this really pushed the limit. Four minutes on the lunar sur uh, surface EVA number one began at 11.54 p.m with Eugene Sermon regressing at 12.01. The first EVA was seven hours, 12 minutes long and was completed at 7.06. The second EVA began at 11 uh, p.m. and lasted seven hours. And on December, uh, the final EVA began on December 13th and ended the day after. So here's a map of, of the uh, EVA and using the uh, lunar uh, rover, they were able to accomplish this 20, 
a 20 kilometer uh, trip. So this really allowed for different stations or samplings of different areas. And one of the uh, oddest things would be uh, discovered on this um, one of these EVAs. So here, as mentioned on the right, is another one of these LCEP uh, packages uh, that were left behind. So, and the lunar mo module ascent stage lifted off, uh, off the moon on December 14th after vernier adjustment maneuver. Uh, these are like little retro rockets to help by steering. The, uh, the ascent stage was inserted into 48 by 9.4 mile orbit. The lunar module terminal phase initiated burn was made. Uh, December 14th, the second moon will raise the ascent stage. The command and lunar module docked at uh, 110 a.m. The ascent stage was jettisoned. So, you know, um, these things had to go somewhere and they, they usually wouldn't end up either orbiting the moon or crashing on the surface of the moon. And in one case, the upper stage of the Saturn V was purposely crashed on the moon to see what the ejecta uh, looked like. So at least they would get scientific values out of even the debris left behind. Um, so uh, the ascent stage impact was recorded by the four Apollo 17 geophones and each LSEP at Apollo's 12, 14, 16 landing site. So they actually could uh, feel the seismic activity left behind by these impacts. So the mission highlights, Ronald Evans performed the trans-Earth EBA at uh, 8, uh, 27 p.m. that lasted one hour, six minutes, during which time we retrieved the lunar sounder film, as well as the panoramic and mapping camera film cassettes. Apollo 17 hosted a first science ast a scientist astronaut to land on the moon, Harrison Schmidt. The sixth automated research station was set up, and the lunar rover vehicle traveled a total of 30.5 kilometers. Lunar surface stay was 75 hours, and orbit time 17 hours. The astronauts gathered 110.4 kilograms, or this time the maximum of 243 pounds of material. Look at this uh, giant boulder here in comparison to um, the rover in the distance and um, astronaut on the left. Remember I talked about uh, one of those uh, science instruments, simply a color chart. Well, what was so important about that is by taking a known quantity, a known color chart that under pure light circumstances here on Earth, when compared to the lighting of the sunlight on the moon, we could exactly identify the actual color taken from photographs. So there would be no misinterpretation of what we were seeing. And all of a sudden, on what appears to be a gray lifeless, um, you know, textures of the moon, orangish uh, material was found. What the heck, orange material on the moon? Well, it turns out under closer inspection, um, um, this turned out to be helium-3 impregnated, a titanium oxide-rich volcanic glass. So, so what? Well, this is a so what because um, helium-3 is actually a rare occurrence here on Earth. So not only in the future is this important that if we wanted to mine this stuff uh, and bring it back to Earth for use in, in all kinds of high-end scientific uh, instruments here that require helium-3, but we're able to actually manufacture in situ or on, in place on the surface of the moon, the oxygen and fuels needed for sustaining life and missions on the moon. So this was a major discovery um, uh, for, for the moon uh, with this orange uh, soil. This is one of my mo most favorite images here, just standing at the edge of the crater. Uh, Ronald Evans performed the Trans-Earth EVA um, oh, this was the same text as before, but um, you could see that they were getting out of the lunar rover right at the edge, and you could see the different colors here uh, on the edge of the craters and the boulders, and it's just a, an amazing thing. But by looking at the different color of these materials, um, they had different, uh, you could tell different origins. Some of the material was turned up by volcanic activity or by uh, meteorite impacts. Um, with, with the impact um, taking out the ejecta and um, displacing it on the surface of the moon. So uh, the, the splashdown we see with the perfect uh, parachute, the three opening. And um, I know even to today, NASA prefers to splash down in the ocean uh, for an easier landing and recovery of uh, both uh, crew and capsule and uh, aircraft carriers um, assisted. 
So to move on, um, what does this mean for today? And what is going on today? So one of the major things that we're taking from the moon, almost like a gift for us even to today and the future, were those core samples that I mentioned, 10 feet deep of these core samples, getting away from the powder uh, on the surface. And not only the striking beauty and the contrast uh, of the, the, you know, just being on the moon, this is an amazing thing to behold, but the actual science of it. So after a lot of these investigations, there were competing theories about how the moon was formed, for example. Was it something captured? Was it a collision? The strong feeling today is that it was a collision uh, in the early formation of the solar system of a large body, if I'm not mistaken, a Mars-sized body that collided with the uh, early Earth. Um, uh, I, I can't pronounce this properly, Teia, I believe this, uh, the uh, uh, Selene was the goddess of the moon, and Teia is apparently the body that slammed into the Earth, colliding it, and through that formation, the moon um, ended up, uh, you know, in formation orbiting around the Earth. And the moon, so here it says, the moon was created when a rock the size of Mars slammed into the Earth shortly after the solar system began, forming about 4.5 billion years ago, according to the leading theory. Um, this is supported by, so far, the materials that were recovered from the surface of the moon. Now, we, we have a very strong feeling about the composition of, of the Earth here um, through seismic activities, volcanoes, uh, probes, um, using... Um, uh, seismographs and, and other sciences about, you know, how wave, um, um, waves travel through the Earth. Using many instruments on the moon, we were able to construct a fair um, detailed uh, idea of the core of the moon. The, there's a belief that the, the core of the moon still is molten, but it's a very small core compared to the Earth. And so the moon is quite quiet in that regards in, in volcanic activity. However, um, the, a lot of the craters that we find were not volcanic in nature, but truly uh, impact craters. And it does show, because of the moon doesn't have, as uh, well, has some frozen water, but not, you know, an atmosphere or water the way we do on Earth. So it's almost like a perfect record, you could say, of activity where it's been struck over and over by debris. And even to today, we get occasional glimpses of flashes of light that even amateur astronomers capture, where to today we still see the moon being bombarded by meteorites. And this shows that if it weren't for the atmosphere protecting the Earth, um, we would have the same, like we have been bombarded by the same, um, the same material over all this time. It's just been hidden by erosion and, and water and, and other things. So this is really important for us to know, also to protect us uh, here on Earth for the future. But the moon is quite pockmarked and um, it's mostly due to impact and not volcanic activity. Of course, the dark mare is from, you know, overflowing of, of, of magma and uh, churning of the surface, but this is much earlier on in the formation of the moon. So here the moon is not round or spherical. Instead, it's shaped like an egg. If you go outside and look up, one of the small ends is pointing right at you, and it's the moon's center of mass is not at the geometric center of the satellite, it's about 1.2 miles off center. So Apollo astronauts used seismometers during their visits to the moon and discovered that the gray orb isn't totally dead, a totally dead place, geologically speaking. Small moon quakes originating several miles or kilometers below the surface are thought to be caused by the gravitational pull of Earth and not, let's say, a molten core. Sometimes tiny fractures appear at the surface and gas escapes. Scientists think that the moon probably has a core that is hot and perhaps partially molten as it Earth's core, but data from NASA's Lunar Prospector spacecraft showed that in 1999, the moon's core is small, probably between 2% and 4% of its mass. This is very tiny compared with Earth, in which the iron core makes up about 30% of the moon's mass. So here is today's modern take. On the right is an actual moon sample uh, in the Oval Office um, in Washington. Um, and these are um, in nitrogen encased um, uh, containers. On occasion, we do get these loaned out by NASA uh, for here in Montreal, for example, the Cosmodome. 
Um, Karim mentioned, mentioned earlier the, uh, at the, um, in the, uh, the museum in Toronto, um, the Aga Khan Museum, that they had a moon rock uh, exhibit. And when you think about what it takes and what it took to bring these samples, these precious hundreds of pounds, that's all there was, of samples back to Earth. So when we get these samples, it really is one in a billion. It, it really is something spectacular. But without having to destroy or disturb these samples, using more um, powerful imaging and 3D uh, imaging processing technology today, 3D scans were taken of these core samples, for example, without having to open up these containers uh, uh, to the atmosphere and possibly tainting or spoiling these samples. So they didn't have 3D tomography technology back in the 70s um, the way we do today. And um, this is one of the ways that modern science today can revisit these samples and teach us new things. So here in the above uh, image on the left, the X-ray computer micro, micro, uh, micro uh, mag I can't say this word, I'm sorry, micro tomography, tomography scan of a sample, uh, 73,002 taken in 2019. So in 2019, NASA re uh, reopened some of their uh, archive of never before exposed Apollo uh, materials. Um, and many uh, uh, universities uh, in the United States and around the world are able to participate in these new treasures. Um, and below is the x-ray scan of uh, the sample taken in 1974. So you could see in the above the higher resolution. And um, I couldn't post the video here because of uh, the way YouTube works with, with um, you know, it's hard to put the videos in the PowerPoint, but there's actually a 3D rotating video um, where they get uh, sliced sections of this material. And without destroying or disturbing these samples using a newer technology today, we can revisit what we couldn't in the early 70s. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for um, spending time with me this afternoon. And um, are there any questions? Thank you, David. It was fantastic. Uh, there have been uh, several questions in the chat about the moon's surface and uh, Several people were wondering in terms of the amount of radiation on the surface, the amount of pressure of the atmosphere. And so I tried to give a bit of that detail, but uh, specifically yeah. in terms of the impact on the astronauts and on the Apollo missions, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what they came across when they tried to, in terms of like just what the lunar rover came across and what uh, individual astronauts came across? Yeah, I mean, I'll be very frank. I didn't go in the research into a lot of the details, but part of that bio pack experiments I talked about earlier were little radio, uh, radioactive, um, not radioactive, but sensitive materials, film chips in a way that were swallowed um, or you know kept with the astronauts to keep tabs on the radiation. And although there's much higher exposure to cosmic rays on the surface because not a total absence of a type of atmosphere on the moon. It's mainly a vacuum, but it is quite um, dangerous, it, you know, the exposure. But with what we've learned and with new materials and materials that can be used on the surface of the moon, we can stay there on, on a monthly, if not semi-permanent basis safely with what we found out about the exposure on the moon. Um, so I don't know about the millirads or, or how long you could stay. Um, there definitely was um, um, an effect on the astronauts, but not detrimental to the point where it was permanent. So from what I understand, because of these experiments, we know what we need to do to mitigate these issues for staying on the moon. And when we go back to, sh uh, go to Shackleton, back to the moon to stay in Shackleton Crater. Not to seg, but to sidetrack a little, but one of the reasons we want to go to Shackleton Crater is because with all these discoveries, no, no liquid water, obviously not liquid, but not even, there was evidence of water found with these samples, which was contrary to uh, 
than what was previously thought. So with these moon samples, uh, rock samples that brought back, there was microscopic evidence of water, but we need a lot of water, obviously, to break down with electrolysis into fuel and oxygen, not only for rocket fuel, but guess what, for living, you know, but for the oxygen for breathing and the, uh, the water for actually sustaining life. So with the lunar um, orbiting satellites we've had over the years, we were to able to actually discover lakes of frozen water hidden in craters that never have exposure to the sun. And one of these is in the southern areas, uh, regions of the moon, um, where the sun just never goes below where the, the top peaks of the crater. It, it doesn't allow it. It's always in a shade. And this is why we have to go back to the moon but like when we go back to the moon, we have to go to these regions so that we can mine or actually siphon those ice um, so that we could stay on the moon. One of the most amazing things about that is the evidence was also seen from the SOFIA spacecraft telescope, the one that just flies in our upper atmosphere with the infrared telescope to point at the moon. And it was able to see the evidence of the water ice in the craters. That was, that was fantastic. So there really is water on the moon. It's just, you know, in isolated pockets. Um, but that We means, believe so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a very strong feeling for it. Um, of course, we'll only know for sure when the Artemis goes. Um, and there's a suite of new scientific packages going up this coming, uh, well, when I say this coming year, 2022. Um, there are a host of lunar landers, rovers, and um, I know that human beings returns. It's been delayed again, yet another four yep. years. And, you know, we know with COVID and, you know, budgets and technical issues, but there's nothing to stop us from actually landing on the surface of the moon. Like many countries like India, Israel, China has their successful landers on the moon. And uh, there's a whole suite of instruments from England uh, and private um, concerns that will try to confirm the existence of water, uh, frozen water, of course, on the moon's surface. That, that lithium-3 is very important because we really depend it here on Earth. It's very hard to find. Okay. I've uh, invited everybody to be promoted to panelists so that we can have just an open discussion if you'd like. Uh, I will- I'm excited. I will thank David on behalf of the RASC Montreal Center, uh, especially a big thank you because he stepped up uh, during the cancellation and immediately said he would do it. And he put together such a fantastic presentation. Um, Detlev gave you a, a nice thank you in the chat, as did a few others. Uh, Harold mentioned that this was a lot of information that he'd never heard before. Carlos mentioned how amazing it is that Apollo did all of this with 32 kilobyte computers. Uh, and they were able to get all of this navigation and all of the amazing actual, just getting there and coming back is just insane that they did that with more uh, less power than what we have in most of our electronics that we sit and pass to little kids. This is part of the reason why I personally, and yes, there's a, what I call a fantasy image of the spaceship, the Starship SpaceX um, proposal, winning proposal that was funded $3 billion uh, um, after all these lawsuits with Blue Origin, they were kind of squashed by NASA and the government. So they're going ahead with this lunar lander, this Bonestillian looking ginormous rocket I mean, the lunar module is kind of like nothing compared to this. But imagine when I was preparing for this talk, I was overwhelmed. I'm telling you, you go on the web, it's a gusher of tens of thousands of ultra high resolution images. We're still mining these images today. Yeah. People put panoramas together. I went to a beautiful display in New York City at the Planetarium uh, with Paul Simard a few years ago, where they had up images of these moon panoramas that you could walk around. And it's like a whole new rediscovery of the moon. And I could say that I'm absolutely blown away by the stuff that Apollo did with the technology he had in the 70s. We didn't even have the, dig like, look at what we're doing now with Zoom. They couldn't do this on the moon. They had to wait for these analog transmissions to go back to giant satellite stations on Earth. Mm, way with the camera. I mean, think it, about it. We take it all this yeah. for granted today. Yeah. And yet in the 70s, 
and, and technology really from the 50s and 60s that matured in the 70s, we did this. We went to the moon yeah. six times and landed human beings to live on the moon. To at least visit. So again, on behalf of the Montreal Center, thank you. I'm going to stop recording and I'm going to invite everybody to open up and uh, chat as much as you'd like. You can ask David questions or we can chat about Comet Leonard if we'd like to or about the eclipse this morning. So thanks again. And uh, yeah, feel free to unmute and chat away.